Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Soap from the Box, the podcast where I talk to actor mates who I directed in some of the country's biggest continuing dramas. This week it's my mate Neil McDermott who played Ryan in EastEnders and I actually spoke to him in the summer when it was boiling hot which seems ages ago now so I'm actually quite looking forward to getting a cup of tea and listening to this one back myself. Hope you enjoy it. So the next guest on my podcast is Neil McDermott who played EastEnders Ryan Malloy and Neil I have to say the first time I worked with you is probably one of the most memorable times because our first scene was you having to run across <laughs> Albert Square in the nudder. naked in February I think was it was. Was that the first one? Yeah wow. our first well one of the first scenes because that was the first block can you remember? I mean that's the weirdest Kind of weird introduction, weird introduction to an actor, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, I remember. Well, de- funny enough, I, I, I heard about you before I met you because oh, oh God. I was good friends with Matt Wolfenden, who um, was well, still am, but obviously don't see him so much anymore. No he had told me about you coming, this new young director <laughs> who'd been working on Emmerdale. And uh, he was really fantastic. So he's a big fan of yours. So and then I, I, I arrived. You know, I'm really <laughs> looking forward to meeting you, mate. It was great. And yeah, so you managed to get the... So it was the... And it was... I always remember that one of the reasons they did that scene was June Brown to say, oh, I say, at the end of it, when <laughs> Absolutely. you ran across the square. But it was the stag do, wasn't it? So it was, I was working Ryan with... Ryan's stag do for the wedding, yeah. That's right, working with Sid Owen quite a lot on that. I think you might have gone to the pub with Sid Owen beforehand. I did, I think. I, <laughs> yeah. I was only went back to Sid's house, I think, for a little bit. And then, um, yeah, the characters went into the pub and were very drunk by the point that Ryan was running across the Albert Square in the nerd, which is one thing you never think you're going to do, I suppose. So let's get to the character. Basically today, I'm going to spend half the time kind of talking about the character in yeah. EastEnders and half the time about you. So you joined in 2009, wow. EastEnders, I know, it's so long ago, and uh, was involved in everything, basically. Kidnap, drug dealing, petty mm. crime, bit of everything as he arrived. I, I mean, I suppose he was interested in his arrival because you didn't know what way he was going to go. No, not really. I was really lucky. I, you know, I spent two and a half years on the show in that stint before going back and doing other things. And... I suppose when you spend a relatively short amount of time, really, compared to some people, you become at the heart of the storylines quite a lot. And, and Ryan really was a story-driven character, I suppose, rather than a really characterful, funny role, you know? Obviously, soaps have their sort of stock characters, and he was definitely like the bad boy role that was coming in. Rob Kaczynski had left not long before, and obviously... People like Nigel Harmon and all those people who played those bad boy roles. And this was the next one. So, yeah, being teamed up with Charlie Brooks and doing... Did you remember getting the audition? Do you remember... Did you audition for it, obviously? Yes. Were there lots of... Because a few people like Nina Mm. went in and was approached about the role. Did you have to audition with other people? Do you remember people going for your role? Yes, there was definitely other people up for the role. I I had done EastEnders before. I know, yeah, I read that as... Do you remember the character name? Yeah. Not Ben Mitt, not Ben the Ruth. Not the Ben, no. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Huge defining part. So when I was quite young, when I was not long out of drama school, you know, my photo arrived in front of Julia Crampsey and she was casting, I think, for Nigel Harmon's role at the time and got me in at the same time as all these guys that were auditioning for that. So I was when I auditioned at that time, I was thinking, well, I'm far too young for this role because all <laughs> these guys are up for this road sweeper. But obviously, she'd brought me in at the same time as then and got me in to play that. So they'd sort of been introduced to me, I guess, a little bit. And then I was up in Leeds doing The Royal with our uh, friend, yeah, Glynis Barber. Barber. yeah. Um, so I, did, I was doing six months on that, which finished in the December. And the audition came in January. Now, in between December and January, I went to India two weeks and the audition came through while I was out there so it was like the day after I got oh back my God. so I got back tan like anything looking rough as anything <laughs> and came in and auditioned and did my thing and by all accounts they loved that so I called me back for a recall and I sort of smartened myself up slightly and tried to think about the character a little bit (laughs) more if you like and they didn't like that and they didn't like that so much (laughs) so only ever showed Deirdre Santa, I believe so Julia tells me uh, my first audition oh wow showed the second one see things are meant to happen I think aren't they They I think everything is meant to happen everything happens for a reason so just to uh, before we start getting into the proper meat of everything I'm just going to give a little kind of fun quiz see if you can remember oh things about right, which I think you should I was trying to be easy on you actually thank you. Like you so one of your <laughs> first big storylines was helping Whitney 
who was obviously your sister. Yeah. And some friends escaped from a fire at the cafe. Can uh-huh. you remember who started the fire? Oh, yes, I do remember, yeah. It was the a nasty is. Nick Cotton. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it was me and uh, Charlie Clements who played Bradley had to sort of rescue people from the calf, yeah. And what was it like? Like, John Altman obviously is a, you know, was one of the, you know, people that I remember from when I was young watching mm. it. Do you remember going in thinking, I mean, I remember going in thinking, mm. oh my God, there's Pat Butcher and there's, do you remember, I mean, EastEnders is one of those shows that even if you haven't watched it, you know about it. Absolutely. You're kind of nervous going into a job like that because everyone's so well known. But the moment when you're sort of on the square... And I think it was June Brown walking towards me yeah, as, same as with dark. Me. I never, I never really saw June Brown not as dark <laughs> for about three months or so. I think so. Um, yeah, seeing her walking towards me um, suddenly made it all feel a lot more real than it did before. I think. And it's obviously filmed in Boreham Woods. You, I don't know whether you, I think probably Top of the Pops had stopped, hadn't it, when you joined? I don't remember Top of the Pops. Because I was going to say, it was, it was always quite weird, wasn't it, at lunch? Not that the lunch yeah. is great at Boreham Woods, I have to say. <laughs> but you'd have Holby City there as well, so you'd kind yeah. of be sat with people tea, like dripping in fake blood and yeah. Doc Cotton sat there as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Did yeah. it make you nervous, though? Does that change the way you approach a job? Do you know what I mean? When you're going in with a really well-established cast and you've got kind of got to... Mm. find your place there do you know I mean as opposed to going to a new production when you're all yeah I sure I mean what they do at EastEnders or certainly did when I was there is they give you what's called a mentor so Jake Wood was my mentor oh, that's a good, good yeah, pick. Yeah, yeah great actor so he I would I suppose ask him any questions at the beginning there um, I wouldn't say he was over the top in his mentoring no, by yeah. any well, what, what can they do really, really do but I just mean? asked him one question really which was what, what sort of level are you meant to pitch at here? Um, I was trying to always think about not coming in as over the top. Sometimes when I watch soaps and new characters come in, I often feel that they're, they're too big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't want to do that. And, but, but Jake just sort of said, well, just, just do your thing. Just do your acting. That's it. Don't worry <laughs> about it. <laughs> okay. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. But he, in a way, that's kind of right. You've got to go in and just do your thing. You know, you can't try and do what somebody else has done before. Or, or, or try too hard, otherwise, you know, you start getting a bit messy and it starts, you start messing yourself up. So you've got to go in. And, and I think I sort of pitched it, if anything, a little under when I first went in, whilst I was trying to find what this groove is of EastEnders, um, which will be different from Coronation Street, Emmerdale, and all the other soaps, and obviously different from other TV programs. But I sort of feel like every show has its own groove, its own style that you get used to the more you do it. And I think it's harder on EastEnders actually for you guys because I think the other soaps that I've directed, everyone's a lot more together. Whereas EastEnders is quite segregated cast wise, yeah. isn't it? Like you have your little family or whatever, and yeah. then you don't really have. So I think it's it quite... was at the time when I was there because there was cuts back on the BBC at yeah. the time. I think so. Those big scenes in the Vic and there's not uh, that many of them. Yeah, they sort of cut them back and made it much more three or four handers, or, or there might only be about eight, ten people in an episode instead of like thirty. And then, obviously, who... Well, no, obviously, you might not know this. You should mm. know this. Who did Ryan first move in with? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, would it be Janine? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And who, obviously, you became an amazing partnership. And yeah. again, talking about the... I mean, you were you were really lucky, I suppose. You'd worked with probably some of the best girl actors there, didn't you? Yeah. Charlie, who is incredible. Yeah. Lacey Turner, who is incredible. Yeah. And Sh- uh, Shogna, who's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Like... Charlie, I really rate as a, a, a fantastic actress. Really, she should do as much as anyone when she, like when she leaves the soap and everything else. She's a brilliant, brilliant actress to work she with. She plays things really cleverly. I think. Like I really watched clips of you today, and yeah, she do, yeah. You just well, watch of course her she obviously plays the villain of the show, really. Um, but she manages to sort of get the audience on her side even when she's doing the most But you did that as well, because you obviously went in as bad boy, and I think to play the bad guys or the girls, mm. you basically need to find a heart for that person, don't you? Absolutely. Basically. Yeah, because if you're just bad, if you're just, but then you become a bit uh, stereotypical. And I always said when I was going in, okay, he's the bad boy. I remember speaking to Deirdre about it, and Dominic, who was story editor at the time, and sort of saying, well, the bad boys I know in life, if, you're, you know, if I'm honest, they're not always bad bad and yeah. horrible <laughs> like most of the time they're quite decent or funny or charming or whatever else and then every now and again they do something a bit ridiculous that you go yeah. right probably can't be your friend properly for too long <laughs> do you know what i mean so that's kind of what i always wanted to do with him capable of doing bad things but actually in general quite 
can be quite decent as well, you know? Um, so on Christmas Day, when... What year? Do you remember what year Ryan oh. split up with Janine? Well, it'll be near the end of my... So would it 2011? I've got 2009, but is that right? He split up with Janine. Or yeah, maybe, for the maybe first it was time, the first time. Maybe that's the first together. time. I mean, you were there, so you were there for three, nine, ten, yeah, three years? Uh, about two and a half. Two and a half yeah. years. Yeah. Diz, I mean, I find, I found when I was working in soap, like ten years just went by. Yeah. It goes so quickly, doesn't it? Well, now when I look back, yeah, it's, it's very, feels like a very quick time in my career, because obviously you do many other things as well, so... But a very enjoyable time and a great job to work on. You know? And did life... I mean, I think life must change instantly for you guys if you go on a show like that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember the different... Do you remember, like, the first time you went on screen and yeah. the difference? Yeah, you just get recognised. You know, that's basically it. Because soap actors are on the front of magazines and stuff in shops, more so than maybe, like, a C-list Hollywood actor. Yeah, you no, don't get yeah. to see their faces yeah. as much as you see. And you're on screens four times a week or five times a week at the time because we the Sunday Omnibus as well. So people are really used to seeing your face, but you haven't really uh, made enough money or anything to sort <laughs> yeah. of deal with that just yet. You haven't so got you that gated man. You'll get on the trains and the buses <laughs> yeah. and all that. Oh, of course. Words. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, quite often people do that thing, do they, where they... Would you get the train every day? From... Uh, I drove, but, oh, okay, yeah. I, you know, if I was going out for a drink or whatever else, <laughs> yeah, I'd yeah. have to get public transport to wherever I was going, or, or taxis, but at the time, at the beginning there, it was public transport for sure. And people do that thing where they, they're not, they pretend that maybe, I don't know, you can't hear them or something, <laughs> and then they talk about you as your character to each other. Oh, he's the one who's been doing this. Oh, see that guy over there? And you know, I, I can so hear you. Yeah. <laughs> what was the main, what was the kind of reaction to you normally? Because different people yeah. have different reactions, don't they? Yeah, they do. I've like, with some actor friends who have, like, people who just come over and some who people are quite horrible to. Yeah, well, obviously Charlie playing that sort of character, people are very standoffish with her. Um, but everyone, you know, kind. That every, I never had any trouble or anything yeah. like that. And people were just fans of the show. So, in general, they were pleased to meet you. But it, you did notice, if I went out with Charlie Clements, for example, who played Bradley, he would definitely, people would want to come up and give him a cuddle <laughs> and sort of make Which sure he's all more right. Annoyed, yeah, honest. probably. But <laughs> with me, they were a little bit more unsure but just yeah. because of the character, I guess. So, who did Ryan hand back? Do you remember who you handed back Lily to after taking her on your return in 2016? Who did he hand him back to? Surely, Stacey, please. No, <laughs> that wouldn't it close? Martin Fowler, Jay. Oh, yes. So, oh, when I went back, yeah, when yeah, you went yeah, back. yeah, yeah. And so the question really off of that was, was it weird going back when you'd left as a massive part of the show and then going back and kind of there's all these new faces there? Because I think Danny Dyer and that family had joined, hadn't mm. they, well, on one of your returns? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is like, obviously, with that do you show... Feel then, do you feel then like, ah, oh, they've not, like, you know, like you've been... Someone's stolen your place. <laughs> No, yeah, I didn't feel like that. I was, at the time, was pleased to go back in. I was keen to go and clear up the storyline because the character had gone on the run yeah. for manslaughter, essentially. So Dominic, had, <laughs> yeah, I think mean, he went, he had a fight with... Um, oh, yeah, yeah, um, Jody. Oh, sorry, Jody, yeah. Jody who played... Maybe the character was called Rob. Rob, yeah. They ended up in the sea in South End, which is another story. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and... and uh, Jody's character never came out and mine did so he went on the run so Dominic who was then the producer got in touch to say that he'd like to clear up the storyline so that perhaps the character could come back in the future and I was keen to do that to kind of because you can't have a character on the square no, who's, who's on the run who's, from Manchester yeah, yeah. So like, and you know, come back and from just, Scotland and be and fine again all be forgiven no, <laughs> yeah. it, you know it, well, no, it's I a square of dreams <laughs> yeah. but you you can't have a murderer you need at least six months in prison exactly yeah so that's what we did we went back did a storyline he went to prison came out of prison and I now believe, I think he got married to a prison guard. That he yeah, had Helen. In, I read that. Helen. And yes. he's gone to Wakefield. Yeah. Lovely. Does he have a child? I'm not sure. But yeah. I Sounds he... more depressing than Albert Square. <laughs> <laughs> married to a prison warden in Wakefield. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, when you came in, you were obviously a mystery to everyone. And then it was revealed you were half brother of Whitney. Yeah. Or Ryan was. And again, was it nice then? To, did you know that when you went on board that you that was going to happen? You knew that you were going to have this family connected and stuff. Uh, I did only by the audition. I think in the audition they changed the names. Oh, okay. So, um, oh, right. Okay. I was um, acting with a character called Brittany, I think. <laughs> um, so I, th- I think that's something to do with Whitney they Houston. Did they, they did that quite Spears, a lot they? on EastEnders, actually. The other yeah. didn't do that. You used to be auditioning for a part who you, and it'd be so obvious who yeah. it actually was going to be that yeah. part, but they call it. 
you yeah. know, Teresa or something. But obviously I knew that it was um, the sister. Uh, yeah. She was this or half-sister. I knew that from the word go, yeah. So I knew there was that going to be that connection. And actually we had a mum as well. We had uh, Deborah, was the name of Whitney and Ryan's mum, played by Ruth Gemmell, brilliant actress, who came and did about six episodes at the beginning. Um, and both characters had a problem with the mum and managed to bond through that hatred of her, I think, really. <laughs> So then we go to, I mean, one of my big memories of EastEnders is the live episode, which I didn't direct, thank God. Uh, yeah. But you were obviously, so to remind everyone, the live episode was all centred around who killed Archie. That's right. And basically, I remember there were loads of stuff going on at the time. So I remember Lacey Turner had lost her voice. That's right. So yeah. there was that, uh, there was a runner who was pretending to be her for a lot, for one, and did for the, the final person. run through. I think you can see that. And on, went to kiss Charlie Clemens. Clemens. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> but what basically was happening was they, the bit, you know, three people probably knew who had done it. And you all got told you were one of the suspects, weren't you? And you yeah. recorded, or we were, mm. you rehearsed yeah. an end where it was you. We got when the scripts came out. I think there were ten endings, so ten different people who could have done it. But then in and some were ridiculous, weren't they? Yeah, like, the I think so. Jack or something. You know, like they yeah. obviously hadn't done it, but you were one of the contenders. And then, but well, it became a stronger contender because in the dress rehearsals they only did three endings. So we did it three ah, yeah. three dress rehearsals. Who was it? So that was so you, it was Lacey, Lacey, and Charlie, was and, it? And uh, no, it was Max. Oh so it was yeah, Jake. Jake. Yeah. So it became it's going to be one of us right. three. And obviously, we'd filmed about six weeks afterwards. That's they, what I found really clever that they managed to do that because yeah. we'd all be looking at the scripts, going, "Can we not tell who it is?" Yeah. Which is mad that they were able to do that. Actually. Yeah, and they were very clever because I remember working with Charlie afterwards, and Charlie kept going. I think you did it, you know, <laughs> like, some of the stuff you were saying here, and I was like, oh, God, I don't know, I don't quite know how to play this. Also, I remember that uh, in the dress rehearsal, um, a director said to me that, could you play that line like you killed Archie? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I was like, right, <laughs> OK. okay. <laughs> so, but actually what happened was, just before we went live, I don't know how long in advance Lacey knew I'm... I think, mm. no, I think she got told just during, before, that, during yeah. that show, yeah. Or so just it was before. about half an hour before we she went was live. Dreading, I just remember she was dreading it. She was like, shit, I can't speak. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to get it out. And we, so we, we were going to be told, us three, who, whose ending was going to be used, if you like. So who killed Archie? And um, Deirdre brought me into a little room and uh, there was a camera behind him looking at me <laughs> oh. to capture my reaction. <laughs> so I was like, Oh, it's like, and obviously, like I said before, if you've killed someone, thing, it's it? basically like getting the sack. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, you can't stay on the square to a certain extent. You've got to... That's why I thought it was never going to be lazy, because I thought they'd have to get rid yeah. of that person. Yeah, But I suppose there was so much sort of reason for her committing that crime. So what was you your like... face then when you got told? Were you relieved or were you... I was relieved, yeah. Because slightly like gutted. I said, slightly thinking... Um, if if it is me, then obviously that's me going out the door pretty shortly afterwards. Yeah. So I didn't kind of didn't want it to be me at that point. But you know, looking back, it was it's obviously a brilliant storyline. So, and mm. that was was it? I think that was the first live episode. Wasn't yeah, it? that before one was. Yeah, EastEnders and Emma, before Coronation Street and Emmerdale did it. Yeah, you were a massive, massive part of it, were you? But were you? No. Was it still? Uh, what was that like going on? I mean, because I remember a lot of cast at the time. Quite a few cast didn't take part because yeah, they would get, everyone was given the choice if they wanted to do it, and a lot of people didn't think that that kind of show should be live. Well, it had never been done before, no. so it was an amazing um, achievement by everyone there. Just for people who don't know, obviously the. Queen, the interior of the Queen Vic yes, isn't is next to the exterior of the Queen Vic. So you're doing a scene inside, walk out the door, you're legging it basically over the other side of a studio. Well, to, literally none of the houses in East End is unlike the other side. So they're literally like a metre thick, aren't that's they? That's right. They've only got a front door. So people are running through studios <laughs> yeah. um, to get to their next scene uh, in, a, in a period of time, whatever they have. But, you know, we rehearsed it, like I say, like it was a theatre performance, if you like, like you would a theatre show. So I'd had I'd been experienced with doing shows and stuff before and working live. So you were fine. So I was yeah. sort of all right. Obviously I think it was, it was the actors who had been in there so long mm. that obviously you do yeah. forget this. You do, yeah. you do forget what it's like. I mean, I remember poor Joe Joyner would never yeah. live it down because she calls. Oh. Yeah, oh, guys, <laughs> oh, isn't it? It's still I know. Very funny though. <laughs> it's still really funny. <laughs> and Scott, I don't know anything. Just right, to bring up Scott. <laughs> sorry, mate. That was right. That was the first line, I think. Yeah. Of the uh, whole thing. Oh my god! But it was amazing, wasn't it? It was an amazing atmosphere. I think, I think when you started it, thinking was... about like, if it, uh, it was fine until you start thinking, hang on a minute, there's 11 million people, people watching. This. So yeah, it's a live show. Yeah, it's a and as an actor, that's what I mean. It could 
it could stay with you, obviously, couldn't it? If yeah. you really did mess up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just They're going to go, right, I don't <laughs> think I want him in theatre anymore. <laughs> no, or, or anywhere. <laughs> or anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, Paul Joe joined it. But the atmosphere, I came in for that night and it, it was just electric, wasn't it? It was yeah. amazing. Brilliant, brilliant night. It was um, an incredible achievement. And the other thing that I remember, our other massive storyline, apart from you running through Naked the Square, but that yeah. was part of the biggest story, which was Barbara's leaving, which yeah. I was lucky enough to, which well, I think back, and that was a huge block, because it was the fire, it was your wedding, yeah. it was the aftermath and her actually leaving, and yeah. obviously that involved a massive stunt, which you did quite a few stunts in EastEnders, but the one with you was you climbing up, and basically, again, if people don't know, obviously, because we did a big fire... And do you remember, we actually rebuilt the whole Vic in the fire yeah, studio at, that's right. um, up the road where yeah. Star Wars was filming and stuff, the George and Lucas it, studio. That's right, yeah. And it was a night shoot, wasn't it, as well? And so then we did the night. outside night that's shoots, right. and you and Lacey, we got the stunt people. Yeah. And that's, that's my first time I've probably worked with stunt people. And I found it quite weird, because I found that the hardest thing about doing a stunt I found was they try to act and they can't yeah. act. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Don't act. <laughs> and they were trying to act just coming off a ladder and it looked rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, yeah, because I think I did like the last little bit, didn't I? Yeah. Last four and steps Barbara, the Barbara one looked so much like Barbara. Do you remember they were clearing up boxes, and yeah. everyone kept thinking it was actually Barbara Windsor yeah. Yeah. doing a stunt and about, but but you had a nut. There wasn't there a nightmare stunt when you did your leaving in. You were because right, yeah. the stunt guy actually really injured himself. He did yeah. Was, so in South End, we we me and Jody had a fight on the pier. That was obviously part of the storyline. We didn't just have a fight. <laughs> and, um, part of the, the storyline was that they both went over the edge of the pier together into the water. It was quite a big drop, you know. So they got these experts in, these stunt guys who are experienced in doing that, and they had to do it three or four times maybe to get the shot and one of the times one of the lads hit his head on the way down on, on like the metal stanchion oh that is kind of holding the pier up if you like and was knocked out like in the water and was set his life was saved by the other stuntman you know he he managed to get him out of the water and they managed to get the hospital he was fine in the end you know thank god but uh yeah that was pretty frightening on that one god yeah and you were there for that obviously yeah i was watching to Sort of make sure he was acting well. Yeah, doing yeah, my yeah, stunt. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> so weird, is it? Because and I remember Brian Kirkwood, who was boss at the time when we did your stunt, and I wanted to go gangs, and he was like, "It costs something like eight hundred quid every time yeah. we go again, or something." Yeah, yeah. Because of what they get paid, and I was like, "Oh shit!" Yes, <laughs> yeah, I know. Not that I would ever do that job. Can you imagine? Well, <laughs> right now, yeah, right maybe now, yeah. I'd do anything. <laughs> eight hundred quid sounds all right. So. Yeah, we'll move to kind of you in a second, but we're leaving EastEnders. You know, what? why did you... That was your decision, obviously, to leave. I know we've talked about that, but was it partly because you were dying to get out to try to... Because, obviously, theatre was your background. Yeah, I think so. Um, but, you know, I was with an agent who said, Neil, you should do about two years. So I got to the end of two years and basically hadn't really had the conversation with EastEnders about staying on, so did have the conversation quite near the end of that contract. And I was just asking, really, what was going to happen next for the character. And yeah. I'd been at the heart of storylines for two years, doing the lives of the Christmases. Yeah. Lots of big I mean, stuff. you were actually really lucky. You were literally yeah. constantly... Yeah, and obviously you working, just when you're working with Lacey and Charlie, with those characters, you're at the heart of everything yeah, yeah. all the time. So I think it was Brian said to me that, you know, he will be quiet for a little while, and then we'll build stories back up. And I made a decision there to say, well, I don't really want to be quiet I'd prefer leave than be quiet. Yeah. And, and if I leave, I'll have another story and then I hopefully will leave on a high. You know, going on advice from my agent and everything yeah. as well to be able to leave the soap and still have a career where you're not thought of as just being that guy from yeah. that soap, you know? Which is always the tricky thing that I any think it's so hard, yeah. That has to sort of negotiate. You know, Charlie talks to me about it a lot, obviously working with her. And she'd done a f maybe three years, four years, and then left and then gone back and done three years and was sort of telling me how tricky it was to leave and, and be seen as not Janine from not that standards person, or yeah. Ryan from standards or whatever. Yeah. So let's talk about you then. That's enough about Ryan. So you were, um, it was actually hard to find a lot about you because you're quite private anyway, aren't you? You don't really do like the bells and whistles. Of yeah, not really. It's celebrity not... life. No, I mean, obviously... Working in a lot in theatre, really. Had more of a TV career before EastEnders than after, if I'm honest. Um, 
the jobs that became available to me afterwards were mainly theatre and mainly musical theatre. But let's go way back. So you were born in 1980 in mm-hmm. Southport and you were, you were love football and you were, you played, I think you were 10 yeah. for Liverpool. So what, Ever- no, for Everton. Sorry, yeah, brother well, Liverpool. No, no, to be fair, that is, my brother played for Liverpool and I was too young to join up, but I suppose would have joined Everton. Oh, right. Okay. Um, but we so moved. how old was your brother when he played? Um, so he would have been... When did I move? I was eight when I moved. So, so this is for like the 10. junior team. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. school boys. That's sort amazing. Because of, obviously we were born in Southport, so it's up near Liverpool. Um, and really in that area, it's football crazy. or well, certainly was when I was there. Yeah. And you were either red or blue. Did that cause loads of divide in the house? Well, he there? was a Liverpool fan. Right. My, um, yeah. We were naturally competitive. So if what it was, was your dad? Fan, was it? My dad was a Londoner, right? Right, so he, okay. He's a Chelsea fan. Oh my God. I know. And... My little brother's Aston Villa, and we don't know why. We say decided on the way down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so but when I did, we did move down to London. I ended up playing for Chelsea Schoolboys until I was sixteen, I guess, before obviously giving up football to take Be an up actor. A, yeah, yeah, much more secure career <laughs> yeah, in, know, in yeah. acting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another mad one well, kind, although you say that kind of like the same way that if you really make it in football you can earn yeah. millions if you really or not really make it in acting that's what I find really weird about acting that the, like, the level of making it is based on fame which is a yeah. totally different thing I think isn't yeah. it? it's so weird but I, I think you know there, there are parallels between being being a sporting person and being able to be, be an actor as well There's the physical attributes that um I suppose I was good at with sport. Definitely have helped me in my theatre career. Many of the roles I've played have been because they needed somebody who was able to be physical yeah. in whatever yeah. they're doing. Yeah. So a lot of times I'm cast based on being able to be physically capable to do it. Yeah. It what was, did your family think when you... Yeah, I mean, it was alien to my whole family. Yeah. I mean, I come from a big family, lots of cousins and stuff, and nobody was in this right. business wow. at all. Um, not behind the scenes either no no, nothing to do with it so I just had this teacher at school a guy called Frank Waitley who you can say is the brother of Kevin Waitley the actor and he was my teacher at drums uh, at school sorry and um, he liked to get the sort of rugby boys or whatever into the drama right okay because um, he just a sometimes challenge. needed um, some the- bigger lads or, or athletic guys to yeah. do things so he was always trying to get them in and and I think also helping those guys who were into their sport but maybe socially weren't great and I would probably put myself in that category to a certain extent it was really easy to express myself on a sporting field but um in life or in the classroom or whatever else would find it more difficult yeah. so drama became very useful for me as a life skill in order to be able to that's true probably talk. a professional footballer as well isn't it if you think about it really you spend so much time physical but not much time using yeah. like speaking or anything yeah. else everything they do is they express themselves yeah. physically on a pitch or whatever so it was really helpful for me. He got me, I mean, we were at a school where we weren't doing Tim Pan Alley and Bugsy Malone and all the rest of it. We were doing <laughs> Romeo and Juliet and Our Country's Good. And, right, right, yeah, yeah. He was, you know, he was great like that. And he also worked for a company called the National Youth Music Theatre. Oh, wow, okay, brilliant. So he also drafted me into there and got me auditions for that. And I ended up doing the National Youth Music Theatre for two and a half, three years, maybe four years in the end, which is a, a, a national youth group who do musicals and we went so what, up to you go, Edinburgh. Did you do that, what, did you go do that after school? No, whilst in, in oh, like whilst summer in holidays. Oh, we did like the Edinburgh Festival, we'd do a show up there. Oh, brilliant. Like, they're fa- famously like Bugsy Malone was one that did really well for them and went into the West End for like six months. But one of the main shows I was in that did really well was a show called The Kissing Dance. It was written by Howard Goodall and Charles Hart. So Charles Hart writes the lyrics on Phantom of the Opera. Howard oh, Goodall right, okay. wrote Bend It Like Beckham, and, uh, you know, things like that. So they're really top people that they get to work yeah. with. And in that cast, I had people like Sheridan Smith, Michael Gibson, oh, wow. Declan Bennett, who was in these Denders. I mean, just an array of yeah, the, yeah. Uh, Jay Jacobs, who was in Holby. So that, that cast of about 14, 15 kids, there were loads probably of you, about you. 10 or 11, went on to have really decent, successful careers, professional yeah. careers in acting, which is incredible. Incredible. And so did musicals, so obviously, I mean, you, we'll talk about the other stuff you've done apart from musicals, but obviously you've done, your massive musical theatre has been a massive part of your life. Yeah. What was the first, do you remember your first main role in a 
weird, really. Like, I went to drama school and studied acting for three years on the yeah. advice of Frank and saying, I think you should do acting as opposed to musical sort of thing. Yeah. I think that's where your strength lies. And I was like, kind of in agreement. And then you get into your third year and you do shows for agents to come and watch. And, and I was doing a musical called The Hired Man and the choreographer of this in the school was uh, a future Olivier Award winning Bill Deemer was choreographing it. And Bill was with the agent Gene Diamond, who he said, get this kid in, and he gave me a job straight away. Amazing. So, so I signed That's with amazing. Gene Diamond, who was a wonderful agent, oh, just an amazing woman. Bill was doing a show called Babes in Arms in Cardiff for like a few weeks and asked me to come in and do a role on it. First job out of drama school, great, go and do it. From there, uh, I think then I did six episodes of EastEnders straight after that. That's Ben the Road That's Ben the Road <laughs> And then did, played the lead in a new show called The Water Babies uh, in Chichester. And at the time I wasn't really aware, and maybe I should have been, that That's Chichester was the best place ever. Yeah. place to work. Theater, yeah. Brilliant place to work. Yeah. And was, I was playing the lead in, in oh a new God, musical amazing. there. Oh my God, amazing. Uh, but it was directed by Jeremy Sams. Jeremy Sams, brilliant director. He took me straight from that into Sound and Music in the West End to play Rolf. With so it would be the Connie Fisher version, yeah, which telly. is amazing. I mean, that's so, and, the, and again the play, at the time, and it was the Palladium, all, wasn't it? Yeah, again at the time, things are sort of happening to yeah, you, not wow. realizing how amazing it is to be working as a named character, not the lead, but a named character in the London. And Connie Palladium Fisher, version. is she the one that had won the? Is yeah, that, that, that was that one of those first. Like Maria, that yeah. was one of those first programs. Yeah, wasn't yeah, it? yeah. Uh, Graham Norton and, and Andrew Webber. Webber. Yeah, so yeah, she came straight off the TV show into that. And, and so how is it playing, like we were saying about like EastEnders Live episode when you knew 11, what's it like being in a such an institution that is like the Palladium performing? Yeah. I mean, luckily enough, I have been back since, which is amazing. I was, I was, you know, working at, I mean, the Palladium's probably, along with Theatre or Drury Lane, the yeah. biggest and best theatres in London. Um, it's an amazing place to work. Because I always tradition. think you walk in at night going, oh. I, get the I did the second time, <laughs> yeah. but the first time round, I was there it for was a year, and I, it was sort of just happening to me, if you like, and I didn't really realise that there were 3,000 people watching you every night, became kind of normal. normal. I know, but that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. Like, just without jobs, it yeah. becomes normal. Yeah. And what's the lifestyle like? Because I don't, I've never really asked my actor friends this, because obviously you work every night. Yeah. Is it a totally, oh, you obviously live a totally different life, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, as a, when you're you younger, you go out afterwards, I know there's one bar, isn't there, in London, that everyone uh, goes oh, to? Oh, there was a pub, yeah, oh, in cool? Soho. Remember, yeah. Uh, it's closed down. Oh, now. has it? I don't know, during this I remember going there once, time. and that was, oh, no, what a shame, because yeah. that's apparently where everyone went from all the yeah. different shows. Um, just off Carnaby Street, there was one. But you all mates with people from the other shit. Like, is it kind of um, a... there, there, oh, oh, so yes, there is a place where you can all, all the different casts can kind of go late, late night. I, I didn't go there that much, to be honest. Okay. Um, <laughs> but um, you sort of end up knowing everybody in the musical theatre. It kind of becomes a little bit of a close shop or a box where you, you're auditioning with the same guys for yeah, the same yeah. roles. So, but but like you say, we, yeah, we'd go out for a few drinks after work sometimes because I was a young guy. But it's um, a hard life because also obviously everyone else is working nine to five jobs. Yeah, so it's unsociable hours. Yeah. Obviously, so now as you get older, it becomes a little bit trickier in terms of yeah. your families and everything else. So obviously, drop the kids at school maybe at nine o'clock and then don't see them again till the next morning. Yeah, that's you can't hard. Really yeah. Pick up, um, or you know that's working in London. But obviously, when you have to go On away tour. and do tours and stuff, then you're away all week and maybe come back on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning and then go back again on a Monday. And again, um, people, a lot of people listening to this will probably think it's a really glamorous job, which again, 5% of it is. Yeah. The rest of it, especially when you're on tour, don't you? Because you have to find your own digs and everything, don't you? Yeah, you do, yeah. Literally, even when Glynis Barber went and she was, <laughs> yeah. she couldn't believe she was having to find her own... Like, <laughs> what? I, can, not I can, imagine can you imagine that? Yeah. <laughs> she was expecting a mansion in. But it's quite, I mean, I'm quite dumbfounded that everyone's yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it's, a, that's, it's tough, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and how much do you want to really spend on digs when you're going to be there for a week and all the rest of it when you're trying to earn money to yeah, bring do you home? stay with five lads <laughs> yeah. uni, at uni? Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> like 20 quid I can't do that anymore. I think sometimes I've been away, I'd stayed with people, but now when I go away, I think the last one I, oh, last one I did was a, a show called Club Tropicana with a, uh, Joe McKeldry in it, and um, I stayed on my own every, yeah. everywhere I went just because I, I needed my own space from lots of young. I was the oldest. Oh yeah, see guy that's when it starts car. getting bad, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and they're all doing what you did years ago. Yeah, 
hundred percent. You just got so you've done. You did Shrek as well. Did, was yeah. Rita in Shrek, or did she do Shrek after Rita Simmons, who played um, yeah. Simmons, who played Roxy? Uh, so I didn't do it with Rita. Did right. she do it on tour, or did she do it another she time? I'm not sure. Left way after you, didn't she? So she was. I had it. Kimberly Walsh played Fiona. Oh, uh, okay. And then Carly Stenson played Fiona as well. So. And that's what I mean, that's a small world. So Kimberly's sisters with Amy Walsh, who yep. from Emmerdale. Yep. Carly obviously goes out with Danny Mack, yep. who you're now working with him, Pretty exactly, Woman. Yeah. And like you said, it becomes a really small world. And TV's the same, isn't it? You end up, um, I mean, I always remember Glynis saying that she's always up for auditions with the same person. They become like your nemesis. Do you know yeah. I mean? Have you got someone like that? Have you got anyone like that that or you remember from... Um, like, yeah, well, I, well, I you think, and Danny yeah. Matt must be quite... Uh, Danny, yeah, yeah, Danny's a little younger than me, but yeah, I guess we, we must be in a similar sort of bracket. Yeah. I mean, he's very good looking, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as you uh, are. And I, I'm, <laughs> I've kind of just <laughs> edging past that into more characterful work. <laughs> but, and also... He's too good looking, Danny Matt. He's, he's annoying good looking. looking. I, have to, I act with it, so I'm going to do Pretty Woman the Musical at the moment, and I act with Danny and... I basically spent all my t- scenes just staring at his I know. face, talking to I him. I did Hollyoaks with him. Very just unnerving. Believe, at least he's short. <laughs> at least he's a little, don't say that. <laughs> but he's, no, he's really he's a lovely, lovely, he's lovely the nicest man. guy, Danny. Oh, yeah. he really is. And Carly as well. The pair of them. We see them more annoying, them. actually, because when you work with people that are yeah. also really nice, you're like, oh, come on. But, I, but I've kind of fallen into a world now of like obviously doing Shrek and Wind in the Willows and a few other things are basically being cast as baddies as opposed to right. goodies. So Danny, I think, probably is still being playing goodies. goodies. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas I've kind of, because I'm a little bit older, I guess, um, I've kind of moved into baddie area now. And did you, Danny, like, because Holly Oaks, I think, is even madder than all the soaps, isn't it? Did he, have you ever done, you've never done Holly Oaks? No, no, no. I've not done any of the other soaps, but um, do you could say to well, me, I was just going to say, or... when you're in something with soap, with another soap star, is it kind of like, because again, people yeah, come to the have face a little bit the name, in don't days. they? Yeah. Uh, certainly when we were in rehearsals and stuff, we had little chats about life on soap and, and life after soap. Yeah, that's um, the hardest thing, isn't it? Basically, life after soap. Yeah, well, the decisions you make. Danny obviously went and did Strictly Come Dancing and yeah. did, did really well on it. It was fantastic. Would um, you ever do shows like that? Well, uh, now you I ask suppose me, now, I'd yeah, you say would, yes. yes but, but at the time when I was leaving, um, I was definitely of the mindset that I didn't want to go down that route. Yeah. Um, and I, I think wrongly, actually. And, and I think maybe you I should I think so many that. people say that as well. Yeah, but at the time, I guess Strictly was a little bit newer. And I think at the time, you're so big in that show that actually probably part of what you're looking for is to... Yeah. Is to get out of that. I definitely that's... wanted to go and do something else big. To yeah. So not put it behind you, but just to say I, I am something else as well. But I found, you know, I think it would be irresponsible not to say that it is there is snobbery to a certain extent towards soaps totally uh, whether it's is. soap actors or soaps in general so that when you leave your options obviously your commercial options become wider so yeah. you like pantomime musical theater strictly come you know the the shows on tv the reality shows all that becomes much wider but other avenues in this business become slimmer yeah yeah, it, yeah, yeah. especially in british tv and British straight theatre. Yeah. yeah, when I say straight theatre, obviously like plays and things like that. It it ha- it does become trickier. You, you can't say that it doesn't. And it still is. And I think it's really same for directors. Like it's really hard to get work at because mm. a those people haven't actually watched soaps. They yeah. don't realise how good mm. they are. Because I think especially actors, I think you guys do so well because again, just reminding people that you never film anything in sequence. You can be over like mm-hmm. twelve episodes at a time. So yeah. I think practice to map your journey like that is it's strange, skill. especially. When you- Think about across the pond in America that, you know, people who work on soaps or whatever else over there uh, or in Australia can find their way to be Hollywood superstars yeah. much easier. And actually, I found that when I left, the main things that I was auditioning for was American TV shows. That was the main thing that I was right, auditioning okay. for. And that's changed so much anyway now as well. The big, yeah. huge actors are now doing American Absolutely. TV uh, series. It was sort of happening around the time I was there. So as well, yeah. I was auditioning, but and I was doing okay, and the auditions were getting quite far sometimes, but auditioning against people so who were already established Hollywood superstars. Then? No, I didn't, because I didn't right. want to do that. Right. To be honest, I wanted to do British uh, drama, TV, and yeah. work here and be successful here. That's all I wanted, really. If my career took me to America, okay. But I didn't want to go over there and spend six and months to no, a year yeah. and work in a restaurant 
<laughs> you know, you know like you know, every other British actor. Well, but you have to do if you want to spend time out there trying to get a big break. Unless you're taken over there, you know. And then, so now, obviously, you're married to Michelle. You've got two kids. I mean, how does having a family change? Like, yeah. we've kind of talked about it a bit. But, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's a hard career, isn't it, acting still? It's yeah, not yeah. the... It's well, not, you, yeah. you know, you, you, like I say about going to America or anything else, you know, one of the main reasons for not wanting to go yes, out yeah. there and spend all your money on gambling on that career is because you have a family. So you say, well, I'm, I need to work here and we want to stay here. The kids are going into school and everything else. And um, your choices become a little bit more based on that without any shadow of a doubt. So a 13-month contract on Shrek the Musical at Theatre Royal Drury Lane playing a lead role is very attractive. Yeah, amazing, yeah. Uh, and it's a fantastic show and a fantastic theatre and part to be, and people to be working on. But I think acting is, is just one of those jobs that you're always going to have to make decisions and some of them are never going to be... Yeah. They're right decisions, but they're always going to be gutting, basically, aren't they? There's always going to be gutting decisions involved in being an actor. Yeah. I think the, Ameri- the American industry and all that it is tailored to somebody who's able to sit and wait. Basically, that means, you know, you can afford to sit and wait. Yeah. So if you can do that then you can perhaps have more chance of reaching those roles, I think. And then, so, recently, you were, just before all what's happened, you were in Pretty Woman. You yeah. kind of you were touching it with Danny Matt. Just tell me about that production. I mean, huge. That's the first time that's been done. Yeah. So it was done on Broadway, a musical version of Pretty Woman. But they had the whole directing team come over. So oh, right, wow. Jerry Mitchell, who's done lots of things like Hairspray and Legally Blonde over here, so... Sort of, it's one of those ones I can't imagine what it's like on stage. Really? Yeah. yeah from a film. It's very so romantic. Like, yeah, you know. very romantic. We, so we have Danny Mac playing the, the lead role, and we have... A really annoyingly good-looking lead role. Absolutely. <laughs> playing Richard Gere. Um, Amy Atkinson, who's one of the six girls. Six? You know Six the Musical? Oh, right. Um, you meant there was so, six. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Julia Roberts is turning to six different <laughs> girls. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that would be me but Amy's fantastic in the show and then we have Rachel Wooding and Bob Harms playing two of the other lead lead roles and I play Stucky who's the baddie oh so, right okay uh, he's like was he, so was he in the film I'm trying yeah, to think of the film yeah he was very differently cast in the film <laughs> right okay he's kind of um, was he the, pit, short, the pimp chubby no. guy with like <laughs> right, bald nothing heads nothing you mate um, <laughs> Uh, he's the lawyer friend. Oh, uh, yes, oh, I remember. I remember. He, he yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. attacks uh, yeah. Vivian at the end of the film. Uh, and obviously we do that yes. in the musical yeah. as well. So basically you were, you're done press night and then... Mm. We done, so we've done four weeks, we do press night, and another two weeks performance, I think it was, so six weeks in total. And then our Prime Minister gave his speech on March the 16th saying that people shouldn't be going to the theatre. We were in warm-up at this point, about oh to do a God. show. And our producers obviously had to run across London to come and tell us that, tell everybody to go home and tell us to go home. And that was the last time we were all in the theatre together. That's mad. Um, Do yeah. you remember thinking at the time? We thought at the time... It'd be, yeah, it'd be a couple of weeks. It'd or... be, yeah, maybe a couple of months or yeah. so. I mean, certainly back by now, by September, I think we were thinking we're definitely back by September. Whereas now a lot of the theatres have obviously closed down. Which is so sad, isn't it? I mean, absolutely. Theatre, I think, really hard. even more than America, is part of our lifeblood, isn't it? It's really well, like... Well, I think, yeah, London... Uh, like you said the, Broadway, they've got Broadway, but we don't just have the West End. We have Chichester, yeah. and we have Bath, yeah. we have like... I think I think it, everybody suffers. I think it's been talked about a lot. Not to get too political, no. but the um, bars and clubs and restaurants... Oh, I know, ridiculous. London yeah. and all the cities with their theatres, they do suffer... But probably um, because you spit on stage that it makes it much more... I, no, <laughs> well, I, I think... It, so it basically, it's about this social distancing, yeah. thing, isn't it? About having And you can't of open a theatre with that lesser people, can you? And we're, you know, I did how, always think the orchestra below deck, that's quite a yeah. enclosed little warm space as well. That's probably yeah. quite bad. I don't know. <laughs> but, the orchestra. But yeah, I agree. And also, that? us on stage. Yeah. You know... Danny and Amy have lots of lovely romantic kissing scenes and things, and um, which, you can't. which they would have to be in a bubble uh, which or the would be whole horrendous, car. Think, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's all in a hotel together. For six months. Oh, oh my god! So, otherwise, you do a concert version of the shows, which people are doing. 
What would that? What do you mean a concert version? So in terms of just standing there and singing the songs. Oh, and okay. The lines, oh, um, cars, yeah. Well, they, you know, they're doing kind of very... what soaps are doing now at the moment. Well, with all their perspex screens, I've yeah, seen the, um, amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, maybe you and could real do life and real life partners screens. coming to act as well. Apparently. Oh, really? To do kissing scenes. Oh, I see. Yeah, back. and then filming them from there. I did see that. Yeah, which is still that. quite weird because that's bound to be like a stunt woman scenario. Yeah, when they come. I'm not act. sure you could like. You sub get away with Carly this. Stenson into a scene <laughs> just for Amy, just for like the no, love making scene. No. And piano and sex her out. and then get her out. Yeah, yeah, it's a weird thing. And you wouldn't. I mean, I remember EastEnders were talking about at the beginning to go into lockdown altogether. I mean, it, again, everyone's lovely. Yeah. You couldn't do that, could you? I mean, it well, would you be can't, so not intense. When you, listen, if you knew it was going to be for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Yeah, not indefinitely. Say, but not indefinitely. <laughs> no. You know, not like, well, it could be three months or five months. And you go, well. And not in Boreham Wood. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, we'd we'd be all right Wood. in London. But. So what, so, so you're, because uh, I suppose the big thing about theatre as well, coming back from this, is, is getting all the cast back together as well because well, certain yeah. people would have gone to do other stuff I suppose well yeah so we were all contract so our contracts ended on in January or would end in January and we were, we've all negotiated to come back to the show to do a six month extension of that contract so it's till July whenever we go back well sorry I'm saying if we so if we go back in October it'll be six months yeah yeah there. if we go back in December it'll be six months but there. no one knows that's the thing yeah, but obviously, what, what were the review? What would, what was the reaction like? Was it good? Oh was yeah, it, so it was at Musk is the buzz. I, you saw it everywhere. It was yeah, everywhere. we were full. Regalman. That's why they can commit to coming back. You know, where some shows have had to cancel together be, yeah. because it sold really well, and because it was, you know, the, the audiences were loving it, and they can they know that when they do reopen, it's going to be full, and they're going to make some money, and then they'll probably take the show on tour. They'll have a long term plan. It'll probably do a worldwide tour, um, not with us, but with you know other yeah. casts. So they obviously have to think long term and six months or a year in the West End is the perfect way to start that long term plan. Yeah. You go, it's West End hit, Pretty Woman goes on tour, goes on world world tour. And then they make another film with you in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so a fi- musical version, finally, yeah. what is the difference between so the but you know, if you're in a big soap, you're massive and you get a buzz, I suppose, from everyone's watching, everyone's commenting, and you've got the theatre, there's instant gratification. How would yeah. you compare them both and what's the what's you know you've been probably at the height of telly in the height of theater now so what yeah. what's the you know well I, I think the sort of celebrity of, of working on a soap is definitely slightly different from working in, in a musical you get people come to stage door and you get the audience uh, really enjoying your performance and everything else but it's not quite the same as walking around the streets and yeah, being recognized just, yeah do you still get recognized for instance? um I th- uh much less so the the longer you're away yeah, from the soap yeah but yes, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, certainly people who are proper fans of the show yeah. would, would know. You're supposed to be in prison. Oh, no, yeah. you're supposed to be in Wakefield. Yeah, absolutely. Is that but, Helen? <laughs> Helen? <laughs> but, um, yeah, so there's that. Um, and trying to think, obviously, working in theatre, you, you do get the, like you say, the instant gratification. And I think it is everybody, most people like working with that way because it's there straight away. Yeah. You, you can you play your part from start to end, so you get to play the whole story. And what's it like doing, because I suppose that the other ma- massive difference is EastEnders, you know, you <laughs> screw up that script and it's done. Mm. Like, whereas theatre, you're doing the same thing every night. I mean, yeah. I've never quite got how you do the yeah. same thing every night. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like, I've worked with people, like, I worked with on with Matt Wolfenden on a pantomime um, called the Aladdin moment. at the Old Vic with um, just a name drop. Ian McKenna. I know, God. And um, Francis Barber. Which was, how, um, how was that? Though? And Roger that Allen. That was amazing. An amazing Christmas. Again, one of these jobs that was quite early in my career kind of happened to me without me oh, realising how incredible. amazing that actually is. Yeah. Um, did you did have you... Ian McKellen playing your mum? Your mum. He played amazing. Widow Twanky and, and I played Aladdin, so... That um, is incredible, isn't it? And what was he? Uh, was he? Well, I was only going to say that you know that was obviously a relatively short run, maybe two months. But Ian, on one hand, was with the script, was able to be was different every night. If yeah, you like sort of tried to stay in the moment and gave a freshness to what he was doing, <laughs> Which... and it was amazing. Roger Allen, on the other hand, was equally amazing, but did exactly the same thing right, every okay. night. Sort of knew what he needed to land and do, yeah. and to get the audience response. And think about pantomime, there's a lot of response. So, And he could do the same thing and get the same response every night. Whereas Ian, I, I guess by the nature of being a bit more 
uh, relaxed with it and, yeah. and could go anywhere. And which I suppose you different. can do a bit yeah. that, can't you? Yeah, I mean, this was a mid shape. This was like a. An yeah, no, I would love to. I, that's one of the ones I wish. I remember Matthew telling me about that, and I was yeah. like, ah. Yeah, I'd love to have seen that. And what was it like working with a legend like him? I mean, did he impart? It's an amazing. Do you, man. I mean, I think in acting, I suppose, like with directors, I think people who think they've they've reached, like they've learned as much as they can, the ones that are rubbish. Do you know I mean you? Because you yeah. never stop learning, do you? He's an amazing man. Obviously, you know, when you think about his career, it's been was mainly theatre as a younger guy, and then went and became a Hollywood superstar, and but still has a desire to come back and do. Coronation Street. Yeah, I know. Oh, I, I know they can believe it when. Um, but but that's sort of, Coronation I mean, Street. it's amazing that he would do that, I think. And to do pantomime. I think it's brilliant that Ian did that and these guys do that because it's sort of trying to take the stigma out of that a little bit of saying if you do so, if you do panto, yes. it's too commercial, it's, it's not uh, proper, if you like. And yeah. that's wrong. And, be, and so Ian to go in and do an episode of Coronation Street, I think is amazing. Amazing. And I think so it's changed actually over the years that's become more I mean we had Amanda Donahoe in Emmerdale even yeah. Danny Dyer joining yeah. EastEnders yeah. was like uh, yeah. you know a film yeah, star yeah a funny film star joining, joining a soap yeah and doing a great job Okay, so it was a few months ago now that I spoke to Neil. Now we're coming into winter and in lockdown, so Neil's online with me. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. You all right? Yeah, very good, thanks. And exciting news because I just wanted everyone to know that you, along with Gina Beck, have written a play and you're putting it on at the Charing Cross Theatre in December and it's called The Elf Who Was Scared of Christmas. How amazing is it to be back in theatre? Mate, yeah, obviously when we chatted before, I couldn't talk about it because it hadn't all sort of happened yet, but now it's it's kind of all taken off. So Gina Beck and I, we live in the same village. We've known each other for like 20 years, having done youth theatre shows together. And we just, oh, we wanted to create something and do something. So we've written and created a show for young children, The Elf Who's Scared of Christmas. And we're really proud that we've managed to get it into a theatre because, of course, not only do we create work for ourselves, but we create work for the lighting team, the sound team, stage management, and obviously for an audience to be able to come and watch something, and specifically a young audience. So we're really pleased that we're going to be going ahead. 8th to the 23rd of December at the Charing Cross Theatre. You can get your tickets on the website. Please do come and enjoy some festive fun with us. Yeah, you have to go. And the best thing is Christmas, you know, we're used to pantos and stuff, so it's amazing, I think, that families have got the chance now to come and see something. Yeah, this is more aimed at, like, a younger audience. So we are, like, under 10s, really. It isn't panto in so, in so much as we're not winking at the audience saying, oh, we're playing elves. No, we're <laughs> sort of um, really going for it and trying to make it believable for the young children and to keep that dream alive a little bit for an hour or so. Amazing, mate. And just, I mean, the outfit itself is worth coming to see it for, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, just to say, it, it's a 40-minute story, a 20-minute Christmas concert uh, where everyone in the audience can sort of stand up in their seats where they are and join in the fun. Amazing, mate. Well, listen, hope it goes well and yeah. have a nice Christmas. Thanks, buddy. And you, Christmas is coming. Take care, mate. Christmas is coming. Bye. <laughs> I'm actually not that technical, so the fact that worked is amazing. And that's mostly thanks to David Stevens and the Bothy, again, for all their edit and technical wizardry. I am back next week with another episode, but you can catch up with me all week on social media at Soap from the Box on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. And every Tuesday morning at 8.30am, you can catch me on Gorgeous FM for another bit of Soap Gossip. Hope you have a good week, stay safe and see you next week. Oh. 